Yes. Good morning, good um, afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to the webinar on the new high impact practice, a strategic planning guide on contraceptive method introduction to expand choice. Next slide, please. My name is um, Agnes Chidanyeka. I'm a technical advisor with uh, UNFPA based in the technical division in New York. I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Next slide, please. We have four speakers uh, for you today who will walk us through uh, the, the importance of expanding um, contraceptive um, uh, options and, and choice. Uh, also go through the, the new HIP with the key seven elements of introducing new methods. And then uh, hear some country perspectives from um, uh, two countries, uh, first from Nigeria and then from Uganda. We will have some time for Q&A after the presentations. Next slide, please. Just some housekeeping before we start. This uh, webinar will be recorded. Uh, you can submit your questions in the chat at any time. Please uh, visit the fbhighimpactpractices.org website for more information. And uh, lastly, you can also download the handouts as shown on the screen. Next slide, please. A quick reminder that high impact practices are evidence-based family planning briefs that are developed and vetted by experts against specific criteria. These are meant for use by countries and they are structured in an easy to use format. Next slide, please. There are three main categories um, of HIPs, namely enabling environment, service delivery, and social and behavior change. There is also a category enhancements to maximize the impact of implementation of HIPs. Next slide, please. As you can see, there are quite a number of HIPs um, under each of these categories, and we encourage you to visit the website to familiarize yourself with these HIPs and, and um, have a chance to use and implement some of these very useful briefs. Next slide, please. So before we hear from today's panelists, I will kickstart by giving an overview of UNFPA's role in expanding options and choice, not only through introducing new methods, but also raising attention to existing and lesser used contraceptive methods. Next slide, please. UNFPA is the UN agency responsible for sexual and reproductive health. Our new strategic plan came into effect this year. We have three transformative goals to end unmet need for family planning, end preventable maternal deaths, and end gender-based violence and harmful practices. We know for family planning, approximately 270 million women aged 15 to 49 years have unmet need for contraception. We also know that access to contraceptives, family planning information and services, prevents pregnancy-related morbidity and mortality, advances human rights and empowers women and girls. Next slide, please. Our focus in UNFPA has been to broaden the range of contraceptive products in our contraceptive basket to allow for a method mix that covers a wide range of categories and also options within these, these categories. Quality assured products form the foundation of what is offered to countries in the UNFPA catalog. To optimize demand and supply, our market shaping initiatives have included price reductions and volume guarantees. For example, as seen for implants and the subcutaneous DMPA self-injectable. 
for the most in need countries that are part of the UNFPA supplies partnership, we have established a new and lesser used commodity fund to enable those countries to introduce new methods into their method mix and pay special attention to lesser, lesser used methods without compromising commodity procurement support for existing methods. This is also supported by a catalytic seed fund to bridge availability and access for the hard to reach women and girls. UNFPA works with and through the governments as mandated by the member states. Working very closely with the governments, it is important to understand the dynamics of the country's method mix. We do this through policy dialogue and advocacy to consider options, uh, sustaining of existing methods, the barriers and bottlenecks for lesser used methods. The decision making always rests with the governments. Our technical support and guidance cuts across some of the elements you will hear today on introducing new methods. We also work closely with our sister agency WHO and other partners on implementation research to, for, to, to inform on policy uh, and scale up. Next slide, please. There are key requirements and considerations to ensure appropriate and structured introduction. At the center are the user's needs and preferences. When users have options and choices to choose from, it allows the users to find or switch their method that best suits their life stage and circumstances. Of key importance is the ability and capacity of the family planning programs to provide the new method. This can be done without investments and support in health system and facility preparedness and readiness for introduction. This is the work our country offices with the ministries of health and partners do at the country level. Next slide, please. Just to highlight the scale and extent of introduction of new methods, I will flag this data, which is from the UNFPA supplies partnership countries. For instance, the etanogestro implant and the levenogestro five-year implant were added to the UNFPA catalog in 2012. Since then, the number of countries introducing has continued to increase to the point where demand now overrides supply for these two implants. Fortunately, we did have the levenogestro three-year implant, WHO pre-qualified towards the end of 2017, adding another option and we can see the number of countries introducing this new method rising each year. I just want to highlight that we also support the importance of options for men. We have a small number of countries from 2020 who are putting systems in place for public sector provision of vasectomies. You will hear more about DMPASC and hormonal IUD later on from the two countries that will be speaking today. We have seen the expansion of DMPASC from a handful of countries in 2015, 2016, when introduction started, to now 42 countries. Hormonal IUD, one of our newest products for the public sector, is being introduced in four countries. Next slide, please. We certainly wouldn't have done all this work without the support and collaboration with partners uh, listed below, just some of the partners. Uh, especially the ministries of health, where the decision making lies, and their technical working groups and some of the newly formed in country new and lesser used product sub, sub, subcommittees. At the global level, the interagency working groups have been instrumental in the development of various technical guidance resources, and you have some of them with uh, some links to some of those resources. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we will now want to move into the new HIP. Um, our panelists um, for today are Dr. Mark Baron from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Ashley Jackson from PATH, Zainab Saidu from Chai, Nigeria, 
and Dr. Robert Mutumba from Ministry of Health, Uganda. Next slide, please. Dr. Mark Barron is the Deputy Director on the Family Planning Team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He will start us off uh, by setting the stage and highlighting the importance of expanding choice. I'll hand over the floor to our first panelist. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Agnes. Um, uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak and to all of you who are uh, listening in uh, this morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you are. So I'm just going to um, say a few words, as Agnes said, to uh, set the stage. If you'll uh, go to the next slide, please. So you uh, you saw this slide a moment ago, and in the, the bigger circle there in the upper right is the hip brief, if you have seen it. And in the corner of that brief is a little blue box. And I just wanted to read what's written in that box. It says introducing, which is inside that magnifying glass there. It says introducing new contraceptive options, including multiple products within a method category into a health system and market can contribute to broader efforts to meet individuals' needs and desires throughout their reproductive lives. And I think it's important for us to keep that in mind because despite the dramatic increases in use of modern contraceptives around the world over the past 50 years or so, and the, the wide variety of methods that exist, you saw some of those on the slide that Agnes just showed, Clearly, the needs and desires of many women and girls are uh, still not being met. Uh, next slide, please. So Agnes also mentioned, um, with a slightly different number, but I uh, took this number from the UNFPA State of the World's Population Report, and it mentioned that uh, 257 million women are wanting to avoid pregnancy, but not using the safe uh, method. So clearly we're not meeting everyone's needs uh, in one way or another. And we know, I think probably everybody on, this, on the call knows uh, on the right-hand side reasons why. So awareness, for example, people, uh, women and couples don't know about contraceptives or there are many myths and misconceptions. Accessibility, which includes cost, of course, as well as perhaps things like distance, to a place to get the method or a lack of trained providers, if it's a provider-dependent method. Opposition, of course, especially in some settings, is a major uh, issue, whether that's the partner's opposition, uh, another family member, or uh, the woman her, herself who's opposed to the idea of contraception. And then lastly, we have challenges with available methods. So currently, the available options are not meeting many women's needs. And if you'll uh, go to the next slide, I just wanted to uh, show one slide that highlights the importance of understanding uh, the user's needs and uh, preferences. So we know that method-related dissatisfaction remains a primary reason for non-use and discontinuation. So if you look at the upper graphic in this uh, slide, you can see the concerns about side effects and health risks of the currently available methods is the number one reason for non-use among women who uh, say they don't want to get pregnant but are not using the method. And in the, the lower slide, the lower graphic there, you can see that after wanting to become pregnant, side effects and health concerns is, is the next largest reason for discontinuation. And it's not on this slide, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but we do know that bleeding-related side effects are, uh, in fact, one of the uh, largest concerns for many women in many settings. And so if we could find a way on, that, on the right slide, if we could develop some methods uh, that address these side effects and health concerns that women have, we could make, uh, we could help these women uh, use contraception and really increase the numbers of users as, it, indicated there on the right. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to uh, use the rest of my time really to just talk a little bit about how our strategy is uh, related to introduction and to the HIPs. And so this slide shows our strategy from research on the left to impact 
on the right. And it includes these three main areas, which are those blue boxes uh, partway down the slide. Expand method choice, optimize family planning interventions, and drive impact at scale. Um, so the, the first uh, area, this expand method choice, is about developing new methods to meet uh, individuals' needs and preferences, keeping in mind what uh, the end users want. Um, that's the, the red number one there, discover and develop new methods. And then the second is to make new and existing methods more available to women and girls through different kinds of channels that are more uh, convenient to them and expanding access to methods that are underutilized in LMICs. And that's this, uh, the second part, the orange, expand the availability of new and existing methods. And so if you just go to the next slide, I just wanted to say a little bit more about that because this is our uh, work that is around introduction. So we are, we uh, support coordination and introduction of new methods or methods that are um, unavailable or underutilized in LMICs. And so you can see there uh, implants, uh, DMPA and hormonal IUDs. And we are working to help ensure that uh, more women have better access in more LMICs to those methods. And we're also working to foster global and local family planning supply chains to ensure that methods are available uh, when women want them and that uh, stock art, stockouts are not occurring. And then lastly, I just wanted uh, to mention SEMA reproductive health there at the bottom of the slide, which uh, is shaping equitable market access for reproductive health. So along with a number of other donors, we're supporting SEMA, which is a country-driven partnership that aims to meet the sexual and reproductive health needs of women and adolescent girls by supporting country and global capacity to create healthy and responsive markets. And if you'll uh, go to the next slide, I just have one more slide about SEMA because I think that uh, people may not be so familiar with SEMA yet, but SEMA is a new organization that is meant to support countries to evaluate their markets, including in relation to new products that they want to introduce. And this partnership will be country-led and focus on the three areas shown uh, here on the slide. So data, market strategies, and uh, financing. And in, uh, one of the unique and I think interesting uh, aspects of SEMA is that it will focus on coordinating multiple products and holistically looking at the method mix versus what you know we have as a community uh, really done historically, which is uh, focus our efforts on a single product at a time, so introducing a single product at a time. So Samba will be taking a different approach and looking at the market holistically. Next slide, please. Um, so then I wanted to, you know, come back to the strategy slide that I showed earlier and talk about how the other aspects of our uh, strategy are contributing to the HIP effort. So the next focused area the, is the blue box. There is optimizing uh, family planning interventions. And we are supporting work to create the evidence base for the most effective, efficient, and scalable mix of supply and demand interventions which will help to meet the needs of uh, the needs and preferences of women and girls. And so this includes generating evidence to support new HIPs and to show the effectiveness of current promising and proven HIPs. And then the last area on the slide on the right there, the blue box is driving the impact at scale. And we're working to support uh, efforts nationally, regionally, and globally through transformation of the scaling ecosystem and coordination of scaling le uh, levers to support uh, country, regional, and global uh, scaling of HIPs. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, I would just mention that the foundation in, is uh, one of the HIP co-sponsors, and that along with the others, uh, you know, along with the others listed in the, in the right-hand part of the slide, and we serve as part of the secretariat 
that helps to guide the hip partnership, approve new hips, and support promotion of and outreach of hips um, and the partnership itself, like this uh, webinar today. So I'll end there, and I would just say thank you to all uh, of you who have contributed to the development of this particular, the contraceptive introduction HIP, as well as generating evidence to support the HIP designation of all, all, all the other practices. And, um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing the various speakers' perspectives and experiences. So thank you very much, and back to you, Agnes. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And uh, just to point out that your figures for um, unmet need of, of 257 million is the correct figure. That's the latest figures from the uh, State of the World Population uh, Report. I, I, I had a typo in, in my slide. So uh, thanks for pointing Thank that out. Thank you for that. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ashley, I hope you are now um, with us. Um, yeah. Our next uh, panelist is um, Ashley Jackson, who leads uh, the SRH team at PATH. Ashley will be walking us through the new high impact uh, practice. Uh, over to you, Ashley. Thank you, Agnes. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I'm here on behalf of the co-author team listed here on this slide to provide an overview of the HIP guide on this topic. The other co-authors are Devin from Chai, Julie from Japigo, Jen Drake, who was at PATH when we wrote this and is now with Gates Ventures. Um, I had worked for PSI with WCG Cares as well, Carmeet from JSI, Alan from PATH, Kate from FHI, and Sonia from Pop Council. And this guide is intended to lead program managers, planners, national policymakers, and other stakeholders through a strategic process to coordinate the introduction of contraceptive methods through both public and private access channels. Next slide, please. Introducing new contraceptive options into a health system, as Mark said, can contribute to broader efforts to meet individuals' needs and desires through their reproductive lives, yet the global health community has faced major challenges in scaling up new methods quickly and cost effectively with adequate attention to quality and rights. This process is complex. No HIP guidance existed on this topic, so the eight co-authors proposed collaborating across organizations to develop one. Next slide, please. By distilling guidance from 36 publications into just four pages, this resource provides a big picture perspective that we hope can help to ensure that no essential elements of method introduction are overlooked. The guide links to more detailed guidance and resources, a wealth of literature, um, and templates such as for costed introduction plans, which we hope can help readers identify the right tools for each step in the process. The guide was also reviewed by 35 experts across 10 countries, and we really appreciated their attention to it and their guidance. Next slide, please. Successful contraceptive introduction efforts typically include the seven elements in this figure. This is the essential figure from our guide. These elements are not listed as linear steps because the process is often iterative. Revisiting and adapting approaches is often necessary to set the stage for scale up. Integrating a new method into a health system does take a huge concerted effort at the global, national, and subnational levels. Country leadership is here at the center because this can help ensure sustainability, especially requirements for large scale implementation in the future, and clear coordination. The guide links to tools um, that can help country leadership, as including a resource explaining how global market shaping interventions and global bodies such as SEMA, which Mark described, which is launching now, and we're excited to see the role SEMA will play, but these types of global coordination mechanisms or global market shaping um, interventions can help facilitate access across countries. Because scale-up takes so much effort and does spread limited procurement funds across more methods, 
it's important to be certain that a method should be introduced, which is a decision that must be made by ministries of health based on evidence of client demand and compatibility of the method with the health system, as Agnes said in her remarks. Next slide, please. Element two here involves assessing the present state of the family planning market, including both the public and private sectors, which helps identify and understand potential clients, providers, and other actors in the health system like pharmaceutical wholesalers. Market assessments, which can include desk reviews and primary research, look at constraints and opportunities that provide evidence and information on how to guide the other elements of introduction, such as the prioritization of access channels. Will community health workers, will drug shops be primary channels of access for the segments of the audience who are most interested in using this product and who need it the most? Element three covers regulatory approval and the necessary changes to add a method to service delivery guidelines, the essential medicines list, costed implementation plans, pre-service and in-service training curricula for health workers, the logistics system, and information systems. Even under the best of circumstances, it can take years to secure these approvals and see these changes implemented. Through the leadership of champions in the Ministry of Health, it is often possible to move ahead with a phased introduction while awaiting the final validation and approval of guidelines and tools. That can help speed introduction. In addition, manufacturers working with in-country partners can typically secure special import permits to allow the importation of the product for a pilot introduction while pursuing formal registration with the National Medicines Regulatory Authorities. So we have some tips here about the importance of all of these policy and regulatory approvals and how to move forward um, without getting ahead of yourself in terms of training providers before the product is available or creating demand before providers are trained. Next slide, please. Element four relates to the supply chain considerations and requirements that need to be addressed early in the process of new method introduction to ensure an uninterrupted supply of products to clients. New products ultimately need to be integrated into existing supply chains, including distribution, monitoring systems, and processes for reordering. Forecasting and supply planning are critical However, these quantification steps can be very difficult for new products because no historical data are available about uptake and consumption. Our guide links to a tool to support demand forecasting for new contraceptive products. When National Logistics Management Information Systems, LMIS, when these systems are reviewed, uh, it's important to add new products to ensure they're included in this essential reporting system that's linked with procurement. The attention paid to a new method can sometimes shine a spotlight on challenges with a broader logistics system, as we've seen in several countries where DMPASC is out of stock in more than a quarter of public facilities in spite of supply at the national level. It's important to resist the temptation to set up solutions that would fix the problem only for the new method, investing instead in strengthening the overall system. One last note about element four, when planning supply chain integration, it's important not to forget about consumable supplies and equipment, such as implant trocars, for instance, and removal equipment, which may be needed along with the product. For element five, training of health providers is sometimes seen as synonymous with family planning method introduction. So this element is often there, but tracking the number of providers trained, yes, it's important, but support for service delivery goes far beyond this. Post-training mechanisms, such as supportive supervision, mentorship, are just as important as the initial training itself. Furthermore, it's important to use trainings as an opportunity to refresh provider skills for counseling on the full range of methods and emphasize client rights, choice, and per person-centered care. This may help to prevent provider bias toward the new method, which can be a risk. Training can be a major driver of the cost of new method introduction. But digital training approaches such as e-learning and interactive voice response have the potential to partly relieve some of this cost. Integrating trainings on a new method with trainings on other methods, such as a refresher training for all LARCs, can help as well. And to ensure sustainability, integrate the training on the new method into pre-service curricula in schools of nursing, midwifery, et cetera, and continuing medical education systems. 
Next slide, please. New method introduction efforts should always align with the rights-based principles underpinning the HIPs, including volunteerism and informed choice. So as we describe in element six, communication activities that are aligned with these principles can raise awareness of quality assured contraceptive products, highlight their benefits, as well as correct mis misconceptions, foster social norms supportive of voluntary use of family planning, and facilitate referrals to services. When approaching element six, consider engaging potential end users, like adolescents and youth, as co-creators of communication campaigns. Word of mouth through real clients, whether in person or through digital communication, can be powerful in spreading awareness of a new option. Look for ways to amplify client voices, in addition to integrating messages about the new method into FP communication of community health agents and others. It's important to follow local regulations, of course, which often do not allow for mass media marketing of pharmaceutical products. This varies significantly by country, and the manufacturers of the products, who are often the marketing authorization holders, also have a role to play in determining what marketing will be allowable. Element seven is the continuous process of monitoring and evaluation. Throughout the introduction and scale-up process, the Ministry of Health should convene stakeholders to regularly review data and use those results to inform key decisions, such as when to adjust course and how to approach broader scale-up. National Health Management and Information Systems, called HMIS, contain health service utilization data and often track client visits by method and type of outlet or provider. Data typically flow from registers at facilities to aggregate forms, to an electronic national platform such as the District Health Information System, DHIS, or DHIS2. Plan when to integrate new methods into the LMIS and HMIS data collection systems. Most countries only make updates to these tools, such as the HMIS, every three to four years, since revisions require extensive investment and cut across the whole health system, all of the health uh, options available. Identify which data are feasible to collect and most critical for decision-making, given that data systems in many countries are already overburdened. And align with stakeholders on top priority indicators to drive decision-making based on those indicators. This is another good opportunity to connect with others at the global level to align on learning agenda questions that can be answered through studies in, in the many countries that are working to introduce the same method. Next slide, please. I'll conclude here uh, by thanking my co-authors, all of the expert reviewers, and Lee Sims and Alex McClure from USAID who oversaw the development of this guide and helped us along the way. We hope that it will be useful and would very much welcome any questions or additional recommendations you have. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, we will now move on to hear the first of the two country perspectives. Zainab Saidu is a senior program manager on the family planning program and the fighting lead for SRH uh, portfolio at Chai, Nigeria. Zainab, the floor is yours. Thanks, Agnes. Um, so over the next few minutes, I'll be sharing our experiences as Chai, working with the government of Nigeria to expand access to reproductive health services. Thanks, Saidu. So on the far left-hand side of the slide, I've put together a few statistics for the country, which are really important for us to understand where we are currently, where we're going, and where we need to be. While the second half of the slide um, really looks at uh, uh, the progression of introduction of Irish commodities in Nigeria over time and their current status across different areas like policies, um, data tools, supply plans, and so on. Over the last couple of years, there's been quite a lot of successful introductions um, for Irish commodities in Nigeria, um, meaning that we've been able to expand access to Irish product methods in the country, right? Um, however, we've also learned that there are still a couple of areas where more can be done, where there are significant challenges which we can address, um, especially around the area of product introduction fatigue. So we have products being introduced like in a span of one to two years, and then another product comes in. Um, so there's definitely that level of fatigue in terms of products being introduced. 
And then there isn't always a very broad focus on the overall health system strengthening, right? Most of the product constructions are targeted at a certain sector of the health workforce or service delivery, but often leaving out the financing aspect or not focusing enough on governance, right? We've also seen that more often than not, there is fragmented donor funding, especially around the times when the money comes in, where the priority areas are, which results in a poor sequence of rejection activities, which in itself now leads to inefficiencies, waste of resources. And then lastly, we found it very difficult to track progress um, and monitor the products which are newly introduced into the market, right? Because there is, uh, we're not able to track this to these products using the available data tools, given that most countries have a certain time frame, most times between four to five years, um, within which those tools can be reviewed to capture these new products. So, to understand what these challenges are and um, lessons learned from previous introductions, the country conducted a reproductive health landscape assessment in about Q1 2021 at the national level and state level which we hoped would inform future productive introductions, such as the hormonal IED, which is currently being introduced. So the assessment utilized both quantitative and quantitative approaches and identified a few things. First, there is a need for a national product introduction guideline, um, something which could be, at least in principle, be applied to all products, which would include strategies which are designed to sustainably um, improve the overall health system performance of the entire country. We also identified um, a need for defined roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders. So, for example, not just lumping up government, but really delegating the responsibilities of the federal government versus the state government versus the local government, um, even within the MDAs within those governments, uh, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance, Women Affairs, um, Ministry of Research and Planning, how do, all the, how do they all come together and play certain roles and responsibilities within product introductions? Um, the assessment also identified a very strong need for engagement and including of the private sector. I think here was very key for us to have like a total market approach where you could leverage the strengths of each of the sectors to maximize the reach and the quality of services that we provided to the clients, right? And then lastly, there was a need to ensure that match your sense of alignment with product availability, ensuring that that is matched hand in hand with capacity building activities, and also ensuring that service delivery is also matched with demand generation. So demand generation is in areas where that there is that capacity to provide that service, right? Um, next slide, please. So to kind of encapsulate all the learnings from the previous product introductions, the country constituted a committee called the Reproductive Health Product Introduction Coordinating Mechanism, which is the RHPICM, and just basically coordinates all the key elements of future product introductions and basically makes them more efficient, right? So the diagram on the left just shows where the PICM is situated within the already existing RH platform for the country. So the PICM is under the new and underutilized contraceptive technology subcommittee which in itself is housed under the National Reproductive Health Sector Working Group, right? Um, and I think what's unique about this is that the, it brings together experts from all fields. We have experts from the government, the federal, the state levels, um, academia, professional associations, private sector manufacturing, donors, IPs, all with a very singular focus on informing, defining, and um, holistically assessing Nigeria's product portfolio by providing their leadership across the full spectrum of product instruction. So we're talking here starting from selecting whether the product needs to come to the country, determining what product should, become, should come to the country, when it comes to the country, development, scale up. So essentially the fully wide range of functions which are aimed at improving the coordination of activities and forming um, optimal choice for women, girls and men to access family bank services. If I had to summarize like in a sentence, really what the objective or purpose of the reproductive health PICM is, it would be to establish and incorporate best practices into the government-led product introduction for reproductive health commodities based on their experience and also to ensure you know sustainability going forward. Um, next slide, please. Yes, 
So I'm sure at this point we're pretty familiar with the strategic planning guide having been presented by Ashley a few minutes ago. Um, for us as a country, we've definitely strived to align within all the steps provided. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're actually still making several of the steps over and over again, given that there's a uh, need more from that not for them to be revisited and adapted at various points during the product introduction process. So this brings me to the current products being introduced, which is hormonal intra-insurance device. Um, taking into consideration all the lessons learned from previous reproductive health product introductions, the Federal Ministry of Health and CHI conducted a landscape assessment to really assess the market for this new product. So what are the areas, what are the, what should they be targeted? Would it be a replacement, another replacement, which, which section of the um, um, existing product basket would benefit most, which users, new users, um, current users, also to make sure that you know um, the appropriate regulatory approvals are in place and um, definitely with collaboration with stakeholders, um, develop the country's national hormonal intrauterine device introduction and scale of plan, um, which then incorporated plans for each of the other elements within the iterative process. So the plan itself is a four-year plan, which details the approach for having a phased introduction of hormonal IUD. Um, following the approval by the Honorable Minister of Health, the plan has since been launched and the implementation is well underway. So I think for me, um, the opinion section here is the government-led coordination, as this cuts across all the other elements, whether we're talking about forecasting of commodities, the procurements, whether it's distribution to the last mile, whether we're talking about monitoring through the existing LMIS channels, whether they are paper-based or electronic, whether we're talking about development and updating of the existing training materials, whether we're talking about tracking training progress and, and so on, you know, none of these are really sustainably achievable without government ownership and leadership. Next slide, please. So I would like to um, end with a focus on the successes recorded early on within the Nigeria um, hormonal IED introduction process. So starting with the realization, first of all, um, by the government that there is a need for this product, right, which was also informed by the landscape assessment. Um, and also the drive by the Federal Ministry of Health in identifying a need for a phased approach to ensure that um, all the critical elements are in place and lessons learned can inform further scale up. Um, this is specifically relating to, you know, trying to match capacity building with demand generation activities, procurement and distribution chain activities, all in line with ensuring that there is global and in-country availability of the product. And I think this has translated to a stronger sense of alignment and visibility within the key players in their respective roles and responsibilities. Um, for us as a country also, by being able to build a pool of trainers across the entire state, so Nigeria is really wide, we have 36 states plus the FCTV 37 basically autonomous um, regions, the government has created an opportunity for equitable access across um, and the eligibility of training, you know, eligible healthcare providers, right? So that means that um, that has kind of mitigated some of those challenges we've seen in the past where, you know, there could be no funds allocated to certain areas or regions with capacity strengthening. But this has actually been mitigated now you know, following this approach. And I think that building on this country is really in a good place for Chile with the IED scale up. So um, I think it's a really good starting point for us. And it sets the pace for the year two, year three, and year four of the strategy where we can continue to apply the necessary steps within the planning guide and um, continue to document and leverage opportunities to share learnings with the global SRH community. Um, thank you very much. Next slide. I think that's my final slide. Over to you, Agnes. Thank you, Zainab. Um, it is always a privilege to hear from the perspectives from the Ministry of Health. Our final panelist today is uh, Dr. Mutumba, who is the Principal Medical Officer in the Reproductive and Infant Health Division at the Ministry of Health, Uganda. Dr. Mutumba, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to also present our perspectives uh, from Uganda. And I'm going to really to focus on the road uh, in terms of introduction of the DMPS subcute for self uh, injection. Next slide. 
Yeah, so the, 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 the graphs above speak to <clears throat> the steps that we have really undertaken. And those are some of the results in terms of uh, introducing the, the DMPS acute for self-injection, both in the public, but also in the private sector. And just current, kindly just scroll to the next, just move to the next uh, slide. Yes, so we've really been taken through the various steps, the seven steps in, in uh, uh, contraceptive method introduction. But I want to mention that in regards to step one, we've really seen the Ministry of Health leading the coordination mechanism uh, that, has, uh, that was put in place to track self-injection uh, and also other self-care initiatives. And this actually, we termed this as the National Self-Care Expert Working Group that has really been critical in driving uh, processes to coordinate, you know, the use of DMPS uh, for self-care. And as a country, we were also able to develop and implementing a costed uh, introduction and a scale up plan. And, and maybe also just away from the DMPS acute, just to mention that as a country, we are also in the process of introducing a hormonal IUD and into the public sector, and that's uh, Mirena. But also we, we've also started discussions around introducing a Vibella as also one of the uh, a hormonal IUD option. And uh, we are very grateful that in this process of planning, uh, we have had very uh, serious ongoing linkages and collaborations with quite a number of partners. And particularly, I'd like to mention the Global Path uh, GSI DMPS Acute Access Collaborative, uh, where we've been able to have cross-country learning and have been able to receive uh, technical assistance through these engagements uh, and also the global uh, supply uh, chain planning. Uh, next, in terms of assessing the market, yes, we did uh, through these various stakeholder assessments, we are able to set up a research agenda to, inf to inform the introduction and scale up for the DMPA subcute. We learned that self-injection enables women using uh, contraception for quite a longer uh, period of time. Uh, the research undertaken also shows that uh, self-injection clients were more likely to be first-time FP users, but also the data also showed that they were relatively younger users compared to the rest of the other uh, methods. And just to also add that as a country, we embrace the family planning method mix. So we, we bring all these other commodities into the FP basket so that the women and girls and men and boys can have a wide range of uh, contraceptives choices from which they can really uh, options from which they can make choices and the plans have already been laid and underway to uh, engage the private sector given its critical role in the uh, delivery of uh, family planning uh, services I'd like to mention in this uh, webinar that the drug shops in country have been authorized to offer DMPS acute for self-injection. And the team is currently now engaging. We've already engaged the Uganda Pharmaceutical Society to also ensure that the pharmacies are also authorized to provide a self-injection. Uh, Next. In terms of securing a policy and regulatory approvals, we've undertaken the following uh, milestones. In 2014, we had the DMPS acute registered as an initial step. In 2016, we had DMPS acute integrated in the essential uh, medicines lists. And I think on the left, you can appreciate some of the recommended steps that we really need to follow. And in 2016, still, we included DMPS subcutes in the clinical guidelines for, for, for administration by the health workers, but also 
uh, the the village health team the volunteers which whom we normally term as vhts in uganda in 2017 we had dmps acute approved for self-injection uh, by uganda's national drug authority and 2018 as per these uh, milestones achieved we had the dmps acute integrated in our country's hmis health management information system so that we are we are now able to capture data on the, the clients who really receive uh, dmpa as uh, acute in 2019 through the self-care expert working group the ministry of health again working with partners was able to secure approval of self-injection for inclusion in the country's uh, clinical guidelines and rollout. And uh, at the moment, we are actually implementing a national scale up for the DMPA subcute. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Uganda is really among the very first countries to really take on the DMPA subcute uh, for self injection, I think, in the sub Saharan region. Next. Dr. Mutumba, are you still um, connected? I think we've lost you. Hello. <coughs> we can hear oh, you. Oh, yes. I think I'd been blocked. Uh, I was mentioning that, uh, that as a country, we were able to in integrate DMPS subcute into our uh, logistics management info systems, uh, particularly to ensure that we track efforts in the use of DMPS subcute. And I uh, to mention, that at the moment there's still ongoing uh, capacity building efforts in terms of training of focal uh, persons and in charges on how to use data to forecast the DMPS acute needs. And this has been incorporated with other ongoing uh, logistics management uh, trainings. DMPS acute was included in the product uh, quantification activities. And uh, as a, a challenge, we still have stockouts. We experience stockouts as actually a major challenge for the DMPA subcute and um, among other uh, products. So Uganda is currently shifting to new commodity ordering system. And we look out for, to see this system uh, addressing last mile supply chain issues. Uh, next. Yes, in terms of uh, step number five, that looks at supporting the system workforce to offer quality service delivery, we have uh, moved very significant steps. And, and uh, to mention that self-injection has been integrated in FP service delivery points through uh, various trainings, uh, support supervision, and monitoring activities. And of course, uh, much of what is required by the health workers is really the capacity, especially when you're speaking about a new uh, contraceptive uh, commodity. So self-injection has also been integrated in the national pre-training curriculum so that we have health workers uh, talk about midwives and nurses coming out of these training institutions with adequate knowledge on self-injection. Uh, and we have ongoing advocacy to ensure that we update, revise, and also disseminate policies to ensure that we have uh, DMPS acute uh, for self-injection available, uh, all in the name of ensuring informed choice uh, for the users. Next. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Step number six. Uh, in terms of building awareness and supporting voluntary use, we have had provider training, uh, but again, more of these are underway to improve the quality of the counseling for the DMPS upgrade. And you know, if you're talking about a new contraceptive method, uh, there's really need to ensure that the providers themselves get adequate knowledge in regards to this new method and, and also ensure that they pass on the same to the intended uh, potential users. 
implementation research and ongoing support mechanism for effectively for effective counseling of the clients for self-injection we have an initiative on self-injection again working in a marriage with many other partners uh, to ensure that this takes course there's been a lot of mobilization and coordination of family planning champions so we have the, the, the those that have already been able to use the self-care and we ensure that these champions are agents of you know advocacy and are able to share some of the experiences with other with other uh, individuals interpersonal communication and ICC materials are really very critical when you're building this awareness and this is something that we are also working on existing uh, family planning uh, methods in uh, an understanding understanding the client journeys and amplifying the voices and ensuring that uh, we have you know all these qi processes of client flows summarized at the facilities uh, next This is really very, very critical. And again, uh, uh, in this, I think other methods like the IUD conversations that we are having as a country, uh, there is ongoing documentation and monitoring of the scale up implementation. Just to mention that as a country, we are actually revising our HMIS tools uh, to ensure that we have, uh, in, we include columns to capture data on clients who receive uh, DMPS acute as provider administered, but also uh, those who receive it via self injection. This is ongoing. There's also collection of priority data on self injection. And uh, we recently had some of this happening in one of the districts where the initial pilot on the DMPS acute for self-care uh, is taking place. So this is really very uh, high on the priority to inform uh, next steps. Mechanisms and resources to facilitate application of data to improve FP service delivery, and the continued efforts to integrate uh, self-injection in the HMI, which I have uh, earlier alluded to. And lastly, a collaboration with the PMA uh, on self-injection data collection, but also other key actors, uh, including academia, but also working again collaboratively with other uh, partners in this space to ensure that we have quality data on DMP subcute to inform uh, the national scale up plan. Uh, thank you so much. This is an experience from uh, Uganda. Thank you, Dr. Mutumba. We have uh, now heard from our four panelists and unfortunately we have run out of time, but just to summarize, Mark uh, covered the rationale and pathway for um, satisfying demand. And then Ashley walked us through the seven elements and uh, key considerations when introducing a new method. Uh, we had uh, country experiences from Nigeria, on the coordination uh, with stakeholders and the work on the hormonal IUD, and then Dr. Mutumba on the experiences in Uganda on the introduction and scale up of uh, DMPA SC uh, self injectable. We did receive a few questions uh, in the chat. Um, Zainab, there was a question on uh, whether um, during the, the, the assessment for introduction, you were also targeting the young population for uh, introduction of new methods. Zainab, yes, I yes. Yes, Agnes. So um, the, the answer was yes. I responded to um, the, the question already in the chat box. Yes, Wonderful. we did. The country did consider that as well and has an adolescent and youth um, friendly health services um, framework. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Mark, there was also a question on uh, what is being done to make uh, products available once introduction has been has been done. And the example being, being given is the shortage of implant on NXT. Um, can you hear me, Agnes? Um, we are, you know, so that is one of, as Ashley also mentioned, I think, one of the ideas behind SAMA is uh, trying to help address and resolve some of, <clears throat> excuse me, some of those um, issues. And we are working with various manufacturers on a number of products, including implants and the DMPA SC, to try to ensure that there is a more um, ongoing, steady, affordable uh, supply of the various products, just as a couple examples. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Um, so just a reminder that if we, we if we were not able to answer your questions uh, either through the chat or uh, during this uh, webinar, there will be an opportunity for responses to be sent to you when all the uh, materials are shared after this webinar. So we have not uh, overlooked the questions that have come in. It's just that uh, we have. Uh, run out of time um i think there was a question for uh uganda dr mutimba uh it will be helpful to localize new uh contraceptives on board dmpasc in particular because issues of accessibility for young and older people is still a challenge many of the um of the sorry uh many 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 of the people are still lacking compared to the numbers that that need them um so I, again i think it's the the issue of uh, availability when when uh we we are faced with uh, supply constraint constraints dr mutumba would you like to speak a bit more to that Yes, and I think that's critical. And and I think uh, even in the approvals at Ministry of Health through our uh, different layers of approval, it was a it was always a question that's asked that uh, how do we ensure how are we going to ensure consistent supply and availability of these new commodities uh, uh, that we are bringing on board? And I think that's the question that kept coming through even when we were discussing DMP subcute but also the hormonal IUDs. I agree, and there must be very clear plans to ensure that we not run out of these new methods, because then the public would get excited and out of the blue, it would be a disaster to see that we cannot have uh, and ensure availability of these commodities. I agree, and it's a challenge that we are really trying to address, uh, both as a Minister of Health, but also through, with support from other partners working in the family planning space. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mutumba. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Uh, some of the questions that have come through, as I've mentioned, we will be sending the responses uh, when we send the webinar recording and materials. Um, the, please uh, visit the FP uh, High Impact Practices website for, for more information. You will be receiving um, the, the webinar recording and some of the materials that were shared during this webinar. Thank you all for your attendance and participation today. Goodbye to you all and have a good day from wherever you are. Thank you.